Today is April 6, 2021. Coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, day seven of the murder trial of Derek Chauvin. We'll show you what took place in the Minneapolis courtroom. The Nation of Islam has responded to the attack on the Capitol Friday by a man who said he was a member. Congressman Alcee Hastings uh, has passed away. We'll remember him with Florida Representative Val Demings and former Congressman from Florida, Kendrick Meek. Mitch McConnell threatens businesses, businesses with serious consequences after many condemn Georgia's restrictive voting laws. Actually, it's pretty funny. He's telling co corporations to pipe down, but then he said, but y'all can keep sending y'all money. Classic Mitch. Also in our black business segment, how can you use crowdfunding to get your business started? All of that and more. It is time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Yeah, yeah. It's on go, go, roll, y'all. Yeah, yeah. It's rolling, Mark 10. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Rolling with rolling now. It's day seven of the trial of ex-Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. Another member of the Minneapolis Police Department testified today that Chauvin's knee on George Floyd's neck was an unauthorized tactic. A Minneapolis training officer clarifies the MPD's crisis intervention approach in hearing this morning without the jury present. The attorney for Floyd's friend, uh, Maurice Hall, who was with Floyd the day he died, does not want her client to testify. Here's what took place in t uh, today's uh, trial. If we totally avoid the word drugs and just to have Mr. Hall say, I was the passenger in the car, which is already clear. There's video and evidence, just for your uh, knowledge, that Mr. Hall is in the passenger seat and is removed by the police. Uh, beyond that, if that were established that he was the passenger when the police came up to the car, what was Mr. Floyd's condition immediately that he observed immediately before that? Would you agree that that's not incriminating if we keep all the mention of drugs or why or anything like that? No, Your Honor, I do not agree. That how that would that, when it did not incriminate the clerk who said he thought he was high, how would it be that Mr. Hall saying that would incriminate him? Well, because first of all, Judge, the inquiry is not what evidence is in front of the jury. What testimony have they heard? The no, I'm just using that as an analogy on how that certainly didn't incriminate the store clerk by saying, well, he appeared high. Well, Mr. Hall saying, well, he appeared like he was falling asleep and it happened suddenly. Without anything else, seems to be a, a parallel type evidence. So I was using it as an analogy. I understand, Judge, but the whole point here is to prevent Mr. Hall from incriminating himself. And him even answering that question that he was in the car puts him in very close proximity with Mr. Floyd in very close in time before he's alleged to have ingested drugs. And again, it exposes him on that third degree murder charge. If there were to be a future third-degree murder charge, and Mr. Hall was charged with um, basically being involved in this drug activity that had caused Mr. Floyd to pass away due to an overdose, him even being in that car um, incriminates him in terms of behaviors of Mr. Floyd, what he observed, when he observed it. So, no, Your Honor, I would um, argue that it definitely would um, expose him to potential incrimination. And the observations of the officer in that situation I think you described on direct examination you described that an officer will also take into and apply to the prison the, the critical decision-making model his own sensory his or her own sensory perception yes right? sir so the touch of having a feeling a suspect be tense right yes sir or loose right yes sir what they may hear comes into play. Yes, sir. So if they hear um, people threatening them or th potentially threatening violence, that goes into that critical decision-making model as well. Right? Yes, sir. And oftentimes, the scene of an arrested individual 
is very tense, right? Yes, sir. Now, defense counsel asked you uh, if uh, the officer should just focus on one small thing. And I would like you to make some sort of comment on differentiating between a small thing and a big thing. Because you would agree that something that is a big thing would probably be more important than a small thing, right? It depends on what the big thing is and what the small thing is. Well, for example, if we're looking at uh, assessing somebody's medical condition right, for the purpose of rendering emergency aid, would that be a big thing or a small thing? That would be a big thing. If then that is contrasted with, say, uh, a 17-year-old filming you with a camera, would that be a big thing, the filming, or a small thing? The filming would be a small thing. If there was uh, something like passive resistance, right, the conscious, neither the conscious neck restraint nor the unconscious neck restraint would be authorized, is that right? Would not be authorized? Would not be authorized. That is correct. And uh, a, an unconscious neck restraint would not even be authorized for some forms of active resistance, would it? Uh, that's correct. And uh, if the subject is offering no resistance, obviously, then no neck restraint would be authorized. That's correct. Or any restraint. Would it? Or any. Or, or any restraint, if there's no. Yeah, generally, no. Okay. In addition to the um, uh, classroom training, uh, you actually teach officers, show them physically how to do these sort of neck restraints? Yes, sir. Uh, at this time, I'd like to republish Exhibit 17. Sir, is this an MPD-trained neck restraint? No, sir. Has it ever been? Not to my neck restraint? No, sir. <clears throat> is this an MPD-authorized uh, restraint technique? A uh, knee on the neck would be something that uh, does happen in use of force that isn't unauthorized. And under what circumstances would that be authorized? How long can you do that? I don't know if there's a time frame. It would depend on the circumstance of the time. Okay. Which would include what? The type of resistance you're getting from the subject that you're putting the knee on. Right. And so if there was, uh, say for example, uh, the subject was under control and handcuffed, would this be authorized? I would say no. Now, in terms of the, con the continuation of use of force, and we're talking about involvement of onlookers, right? The words they use matter, correct? Yes, sir, they do. If they're cheering on and saying, good job, officer, that's one consideration, right? Correct. But if they're saying, I'd slap the fuck out of you, or you're a pussy, or you're a chump, would that reasonably tend to rise alarm in a police officer? Yes, sir. I have no further questions. And if they're saying, get off him, you're killing him, should the officer also take that into account and consider whether their actions need to be reassessed? Potentially, sir, yes. Nothing further. Joining us now is trial attorney Jay Wendell Gordon. Uh, Jay Wendell, uh, welcome to Rolling Martin Unfiltered. Uh, first, Give us a sense of your perspective uh, of that testimony, having the training expert testify that the actions of Chauvin violated the department policy. Well, you know, that's explosive testimony. And it's what uh, a lot of us have been waiting for, to get to the experts. This case, I said from the very beginning, is going to be about the medicine, the physiology, and the experts. It's a beauty contest. And it's, uh, it's really a battle of the experts. So now we've introduced these experts into this situation, we can kind of figure out what what the policies are, what the law is with regard to the behavior of uh, uh, Derek Chauvin. Now, what I see in this case coming from the defense uh, is a lot of copaganda. I call it copaganda. Like, like first of all, they, they make it seem like they're the only people in the world who have to be concerned about crowds when they're doing their job. Nobody can call them a bum. Nobody can call them a, a B-I-T-C-H. I mean, what kind of profession when you're working with the public where you're not going to receive someone uh, protesting something that you do. You should be a professional, like an earlier uh, witness had indicated, and do your job as you're supposed to do it. And if you were that much distracted, then 
uh, you shouldn't have been on his back that, like that. You should have been concerned about what's happening behind you. So at the end of the day, uh, I think what we've seen from defense is a bunch of truth decay. I think that uh, they have picked some, some, they've created some issues, but I don't know that they've created reasonable doubt. They challenges some, they challenged some of the uh, nuances uh, of the case, but they haven't done enough, in my opinion, to create the doubt that they're looking for. Now, granted, they haven't had an opportunity to put on their case, and we should never judge an entire case by only half of the case. But the bottom line is, everything that they're doing is coming from the defense lawyers' playbooks. The three Ds is what I call it, deny, discredit, and destroy, and try to make it seem like we big, black, African-American men can walk through bullets, and we have this superhuman strength, and that you have to and we feel no pain and that you have to just apply the most excessive and sadistic and draconian forces draconian forces against us for in order us in order to gain control of us to put us into custody now here you have uh Mr. Floyd, he's down, and nobody even talks about this. This is an issue that I saw. He's right there by the tailpipe, taking in gas fumes. He's got he's got someone's knees on, on his neck, and he's got weights all over the bottom of half of his body by these other officers. That is a terrible combination to try to breathe in, first of all, and then to have your your breathing constricted by someone blocking uh, blood flow to your brain. I mean, that's just a recipe for disaster. And it's in the middle of the May, so it's got to be hot. The ground has got to be hot. I mean, there are all kinds of factors that they didn't even consider that I've considered, and um, I, I just feel like it's not going to be enough. Uh, but we as defense attorneys, and I do do defense work, um, you have to you have to work with what you have. And we're not magicians. We're just attorneys. So he's doing the best he can with what he has. But at the end of the day, I don't think that it's enough to tip the scale to show doubt. Now, you you may have scored a few points. And, and points are good, so I'm not taking that away from him. But there needs to be a whole lot more work laid down before uh, you, you've overcome re beyond reason. I mean, be... be before you've overcome reasonable doubt. Now, the prosecution doesn't have to prove their case beyond all doubt. It only has to be beyond reasonable doubt. And so I think they're still in, in the driver's seat. Well, one of the things that um, uh, is interesting, the line of questioning, if a cop is thrown off because somebody is cursing them out, uh, right. you might not want to be a cop. Yeah, you might not want to do anything. You might just want to hide under a rock. I mean, they called him a bum. Like, how offensive is that? And plus, an officer's peace can never be breached. I mean, officers are trained to deal with people who are protesting their mis their conduct, people who who protest them, who call them names. You can't you can't address each and every body, every 17-year-old girl or 10-year-old with a with a camera phone or adult filming you while you're doing your job. As long as they are not interfering, and as much as they wanted to, uh, they absolutely exercise great restraint, the type of restraint that Derek Chauvin should have exercised when he got off of, by getting off of uh, uh, Mr. Floyd's neck. And because he didn't, he's sitting in trial facing these very heavy charges. And uh, I... I, I me, personally, I hope he gets convicted. Well, uh, we will certainly see uh, what happens next uh, uh, tomorrow. So um, we certainly appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Gordon, thank you so very much. Thank you for having me. All right, folks, my pound today uh, is D. Hawkins Hagler, former Georgia State Representative, uh, Kelly Bethea, communication strategist, Mustafa Santiago Ali, a PhD, former senior advisor for environmental justice, EPA. Uh, this is, uh, again, I, I think what is very uh, interesting and unique about what we are seeing unfold here, Mustafa, uh, is just this very methodical march by the prosecutors. The fact that we've had so many police officers already testify for the prosecution uh, speaks to something that we rarely see in these cases where that blue wall cracking on behalf of one of their own. Yeah, then you know, they're just methodically uh, mm -hmm. making these steps toward justice, or at least we hope that it's justice. I've testified in a number of cases over the years, and to see the way that they've laid this out, you know, it's extremely professional, extremely well thought out. Um, and yes, anything can happen uh, on any given day by the time you get to the end of the trial, but uh, I'm feeling very comfortable at this moment uh, with how they've laid it out so far. You know, what we need is for the jury to actually believe what they've seen, uh, for the jury to believe what they've heard um, when they're listening to the tapes and the testimony, 
uh, and then to actually both, you know, come to a conclusion with both their hearts and their heads, because I think all of that is, is beginning to, to come together. Now, it'll be interesting to see when the other side presents its case. But, you know, everything that's been laid out so far has been very clear that Derek Chauvin uh, is guilty of killing George Floyd. Kelly. I agree. Um, I am. I'm happy with how the trial is going so far in that, like you said, there's definitely like a a a a logic to how things are going. I am particularly excited regarding the uh, the experts coming forward now. Um, frankly, just in full transparency, it's easier for me to watch the <coughs> experts without the videotape because it is still very traumatic for me um, and has been to continuously watch uh, the last moment of George Floyd's life um, on tape and on the news and the like. So to see uh, the experts speak, uh, they don't necessarily need the tape to describe exactly what happened because they're experts, they're not eyewitnesses. So I'm excited to see how they are going to more or less scientifically and and based off of their, their subject matter, explain to the jury exactly why uh, Chauvin is responsible for this man's death. Um, I understand that the defense is coming up uh, as far as presenting their case. Uh, my only concern is really just the threshold uh, to convict somebody is beyond a reasonable doubt. This is not a situation in which the defense has to prove that Chauvin didn't do it outright. They just have to prove that he is not criminally responsible for George Floyd's death. And when you think about it, given the history of, of these cases and the history of, of police uh, enacting violence on Black bodies, in, in the grand scheme of things, it feels like that threshold is very low. Um, so I just, I hope that the jury is actually really just paying attention and not just listening to the evidence, but also using their common sense because the, the video shows exactly what happened. And no matter what the defense tries to do in putting the chink of armor, um, making the reasonable doubt, so to speak, hopefully they can overlook their excuses and actually convict this man. D. And I disagree with what everyone has said. I mean, they put together a methodical case. Uh, you cannot deny it. And to this day, honestly, I still have not watched the video because it's too traumatic for me. But I know that justice is going to prevail because you cannot help with the evidence that's been presented by the prosecution to come up with any other verdict than the one that they're going after. Well, all right, then, folks. We certainly will be watching what take place. Let's go to our second story. The Nation of Islam, they're responding to Friday's attack that left Capitol Police Officer Billy Evans dead and another officer badly injured. The suspect, Noah Green, who was killed, rammed his car into the officers at a barricade outside the U.S. Capitol. After striking the officers, Green jumped out with a knife and was fatally shot by Capitol Hill police. According to Green's now-deleted Facebook post, he followed the Nation of Islam and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Now, here's one of the posts that says the minister is here to save him and the rest of humanity. Now, this is what it said. In addition to my last post, I encourage everyone to study Revelation, study the sign of end times, study who the beast is, study who the Antichrist is, study who the false prophet is, and study the created images during those times. The minister is here to save me and the rest of humanity, even if it means facing death. Be willing to, 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 to deny yourself and follow him. Pick up your cross. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, his teacher, the exalted Christ, is alive and in power. I bear witness. Study the ministers. Watch his lectures. Study Elijah Muhammad. Study the mother wheel, which is present here in America. I bear witness again. We have a little time. Signed, Peace, Noah X. He also often shared videos of Minister Farrakhan speaking. In response to Green's actions, today the Nation of Islam released a three-page statement on Minister Farrakhan's behalf, in part saying it is being reported that Noah Green was a follower of the Nation of Islam. The young man, Noah Green, we believe may have attended our Savior's Day convention in Detroit, Michigan in February 2020. In March of 2020, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we closed our mosque and began conducting meetings and classes remotely. A search of our records indicates Noah Green was not a registered member of the Nation of Islam. It appears that in late summer, August, September 2020, he started the process to begin his study to become a member, but he did not complete the process. 
He did make a donation to the Savior's Day gift every year. The followers and supporters make a charitable donation to the Nation of Islam's Savior's Day charity. Every donor who made a donation of $1,000 or more is issued a certificate of completion. This certificate does not establish that the donor is a member in good standing in the Nation of Islam. Mr. Noah Green's alleged use of an automobile as a weapon and the alleged possession of a knife as reported violates our teachings. We absolutely disavow this act that resulted in the senseless loss of life. It is shocking for us to learn that someone who was attempting to be a part of our ranks may have been involved in something as tragic as this. But we respectfully say to the members of the media and to the American people, Timothy McVeigh confessed that he was a Christian, but nobody blames the church for his misconduct. No one would blame Jesus or their pastor for unlawful and immoral behavior that is contrary to the teachings of Jesus. You have criminals, people that do horrific things, but we never know their religion. It's not important because religion does not teach criminal behavior. Criminal behavior is an aberration. Criminal behavior is a violation. Criminal behavior is absolute rebellion toward what God teaches through the mouth of his prophets. As I said, uh, that Capitol Hill police officer, uh, he uh, who was killed, he is going to lie in state at the U.S. Capitol, uh, just like the officer, of course, uh, who was killed on January 6th during that particular uprising. And so we certainly, uh, any uh, future comments made uh, by Mr. Farrakhan on this subject, we certainly will uh, share those uh, with our audience. Um, to uh, our panel, to the point there, Kelly, that minister is making, um, does, is the religion of white domestic terrorists brought up? So, I mean, when this came out, folks were, again, immediately, oh, remember the Nation of Islam? And then you have to say, okay, but what does that have to actually do with the actions? Um, your thoughts? I think that the statement that was put out by Nation of Islam was very thorough and very correct. When we talk about um, white counterparts in, in terroristic esque acts, we always, I, I can't think of a time where it hasn't happened, where it is such a, it, it is such that we, we talk about them in isolation. We say, oh, he was a lone wolf. He had mental issues. He came from a bad home. They will find everything about the, the alleged terrorist to, to isolate them away from the base that he claims to be a part of. Um, it should be no different with this man um, and the Nation of Islam. Uh, for those who are familiar with Nation of Islam, who are familiar with Islam in general, Christianity, any uh, Abrahamic religion, violence is not such that it is it is indoctrin it is not an indoctrinated uh, um, way of life. Uh, if anything, uh, with Islam, my understanding is that they promote peace above everything. So for this young man to to subvert an entire religion for his perversion and his uh, misinterpretation, gross misinterpretation of said religion for others to try and take that perversion and apply it to the nation of Islam, even though they have a history, a very right. lengthy history of promoting mm -hmm. peace. Um, it just shows you just how um, racist and, and bigoted this country really is when it comes to Nation of Islam specifically. Um, uh, Dee, um, again, uh, that, that statement there, Mr. Farrakhan says, look, to associate uh, an individual's actions with their religion uh, doesn't make sense. Your, uh, your thoughts on the point that he makes? I actually agree with Minister Farrakhan and everything that they put out. Because let me just be very clear. Um, when the KKK was burning crosses in people's yard and standing behind the white knights, standing behind Christianity as their banner or as their support, no one ever condemned Christianity to that extreme. So even if he did try to blame the nation of Islam, I think it's a very dangerous path for us to all of a sudden start pulling out things with the nation of Islam only because you know, they are Muslim when Christianity is known for terrorizing, people who have followed Christianity have known for terrorizing people for centuries. The thing there, uh, Mustafa, uh, is when you, when you look at the actions of white men, 
their faith or their churches are not brought up. It's true. You know, let's look at, you can go to the uh, lynching museum and you'll see photos of folks after Sunday service. You know, sometimes hundreds of people gathering around the trees when that strange fruit was hanging there and that strange fruit was us. Um, but no one said anything about those individuals who left service and came and participated in those types of behaviors. And nor do we believe that all white people support that, nor do we believe that all Christians support that type of behavior, even though there were some. And we also know that this young brother, where we should be focused on what was in his background, you know, there, there are signs that he was crying out. There were signs that he was suffering um, from mental trauma and mental illness, which is not so different than literally millions of people across our country. And yet we still refuse to make sure that the proper resources are there to help folks, to make sure that the services are there, to guide them uh, and to help them to have the skills to be able to cope with living in a very traumatic and stressful society. So we need to make sure that we're looking at the totality of what has happened in this situation and how we can make sure that it doesn't happen again. And there are a number of different parts of that. Of course, one part is on the mental uh, health uh, side of the equation. And then, of course, folks will always lean toward enforcement. And then, of course, those who want to continue to sow seeds of doubt um, and to create these barriers between communities will uh, lean on the religious side of the equation. All right, folks, got to go to a break. We'll be back in just a moment on Roller Martin Unfiltered. I believe that it's movement time again. In America today, the economy is not working for working people. The poor and the needy are being abused. You are the victims of power, and this is the abuse of economic power. I'm 23 years old. I work three jobs. I work seven days a week. No days off. They're paying people pennies on the dollar compared to what they profit, and it is time for this to end. Essential workers have been showing up to work, feeding us, caring for us, delivering goods to us throughout this entire pandemic, and they've been doing it on a measly $7.25 minimum wage. The highest check I ever got was literally $200. The fight for 15 is a lot more than about $15 an hour. This is about a fight for your dignity. We have got to recognize that working people deserve livable wages. And it's long past time for this nation to go to 15 so that moms and dads don't have to choose between asthma inhalers and rent. I'm halfway homeless. The main reason that people end up in their cars is because income does not match housing cost. If I could just only work one job, I could have more time with them. It is time for the owners of Walmart, McDonald's, Dollar General, and other large corporations to get off welfare and pay their workers a living wage. And if you really want to tackle racial equity, you have to raise the minimum wage. We're not just fighting for our families, we're fighting for yours too. We need this. I'm going to fight for it until we get it. I'm not going to give up. We just need all of us to sit up as one nation and just fight together. Families are relying on these salaries and they must be paid at a minimum $15 an hour. $15 a minimum. Anyone should be making this a to stay out of poverty. I can't take it no more. I'm doing this for not only me, but for everybody. We need 15 right now. This is Diola Riddle. What's up, y'all? I'm Will Packer. I'm Chrisette Michelle. Hi, I'm Chaley Rose, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. So West Virginia, West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin says he and seven or eight other uh, senators, Democratic senators, oppose President Joe Biden raising the corporate tax rate. Okay. This is what interesting. Manchin says, I just says that they are, they disagree with it because it's going to keep America from being competitive. Um, No. See, here's what's very interesting when you listen to Joe Manchin and others talk about this, uh, because they act as if we're the crazy ones and we don't quite understand how they're not paying their fair share. Th this whole notion that corporations in this country uh, should not be paying fair share of taxes, 
It's crazy. Um, how many of you follow former Labor Secretary Robert Reich? If you follow him, then you will understand uh, the kind of information that he tweets out that gives us an indication of, of how these companies are literally earning billions upon billions upon billions of dollars, and they ain't paying much. Um, what, what was crazy about this is, it, and I'm, I'm going to pull this. Uh, so here's one of the te tweets that he actually sent out right here. He says, Nike paid an effective three-year tax rate of negative 18% on $4.1 billion in profits. And you're telling me our tax code isn't rigged? Negative. 18% over a three-year period. This is another interesting tweet right here. If you pay just $1 in federal taxes in 2020, you paid more than FedEx, Michaels, Nike, Salesforce, and 51 other massive corporations. Seems fair, right? The, the reason I'm raising this, folks... It's because in, in, in many ways, <laughs> what Republicans largely and the Chamber of Commerce and big business, what they've actually convinced a lot of American people, especially a lot of white people, that holding corporations accountable it's going to kill jobs. It's going to destroy America. We're not going to be the great economy that we always have been. So who's footing the bill to pay for things in America? It's, it's not the same corporations. They are essentially getting free rides. H here they are coming to the American people, coming to cities and counties and states, asking for massive tax breaks, uh, to build plants and to to bring jobs to an area. Actually, I think what has happened, if I could find a comparison to what is going on, I, I really think it is equivalent to NFL fans who get mad, angry, and upset when a player holds out and they get mad saying, uh, we, why, you're hurting us. Now, they don't get mad at the billionaire who owns the team. They don't get mad at the billionaire when the NFL just signed TV rights that total $100 billion. They, they don't, they don't, it's amazing. The, the fan gets mad at the athlete, not the billionaire owner. So, Mustafa, why is it that people have this attitude that somehow, no, 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 no. We'll happily pay taxes, but the billion, multi-billion dollar corporations, no, no, leave them alone because you're going to be messing with jobs and you're going to mess up the economy if they got to pay taxes and the profit is one and two and three and five billion dollars. It's a slave owner mentality. You're indoctrinated to believe that you're supposed to take care of these entities that we think are taking care of us. And if you don't want to use that analogy, then you can think of the pharaoh who used to have all these folks working, they didn't benefit because the Pharaoh was seen as some type of a god or demigod or however you want to phrase it because you're taught that. So we're taught to actually worship <laughs> at the altar of corporations. We're, thank we we're, we're taught that corporations save us. If it was true, then we wouldn't have these huge wealth disparities that exist between the ownership of corporations uh, and the folks who work in them. And we wouldn't have these huge disparities in many instances in the locations where many of the most successful businesses and industries actually are and the communities that sit inside of that footprint, if you will. And, you know, we just have to change the dynamic of the way that we're thinking. If we are going to live in a true democracy, then that means that everybody should have skin in the game and that everybody should be contributing. 
to the process. And if, they, if we're not going to be honest about that, then we don't really have a true democracy. Um, D, here's another tweet that uh, Robert sent out that I found to be interesting. He said, the three wealthiest families in America now own more than half of all Americans put together demand a wealth tax. Same thing. Same thing. Here you have Elizabeth Warren, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren, making the argument about the wealth tax. And if I'm correct, she was talking about taxing, uh, first of all, a very small percentage after, I think it was after the first 50 million or something like that. And these folks are losing their mind. And I'm just trying to understand all of these people who are fighting tooth and nail for f three families. Go back to it, y'all. Three families in America own more than half of the wealth of, 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 of more than half of all Americans put together. Really? It's disgusting. And the American people shouldn't carry the, the, the brunt of taking care of the wealthiest people in America. We've seen this playbook before because if you recall when President Reagan was in office, he kept saying if we take care of the corporations, it was some kind of way trickle down to the American people and everyone else. And we know that it never trickled down anywhere, and that's why it was called voodoo economics. And then this is why uh, President Clinton was able to win, because they came and said, it's the economy, stupid. And then we seen it repeat again. We got the economy together, and then the Republicans gave tax breaks again to the corporations um, under George Bush. And we saw how the economy just about tanked in every area. And then you have President Obama to come in and rescue, uh, once again, the economy. So we, this is a repeating cycle, and it never works. And at some point, they need to realize that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to play this clip here because uh, I find it laughable. This is Larry Cutlow, of course, uh, who was one of a long time on CNBC, one of Trump's economic people, who's now on the Fox business. If y'all really want to laugh, listen, listen to this one here. Bush and we saw how the economy just about one second. Let me go here. Uh, hold on one second. Uh, I want to get this because uh, I'm I'm really laughing, y'all, uh, at this clip here. And, and, and it it is peak it is, it is peak Republican Party uh, talking points uh, when they uh, when they say this one. Give me one second. Here we go. Uh, I think I got it queued up right. Here we go. All right. Listen to this, y'all. Our video's acting up. Uh, let me do a refresh. Uh, and I'm really laughing because I, I, I love uh, this one here. Let's see. I'm truly worried it, about corporate uh, taxes which benefit the middle class and the blue collars. And I'm particularly ass. And I'm particularly worried about corporate uh, taxes which benefit the middle class and the blue collars. And I'm particularly ass. And Kelly, I'm he's worried that corporate taxes benefit the middle class and the blue collar? I understand why you... In what why world? His, clearly, um, but not ours. Um, it, it is always baffling to me how, uh, again, how people think that trickle-down economics is a thing, let alone that it works. Um, not all, It's not a thing, and it doesn't work. Um, and corporate taxes will not impoverish the corporation. But if we continue with this tax system that we're under now, the taxes that we pay as, as regular people, as regular people, if we keep paying taxes, they will impoverish, impoverish us. So the, the fact of the matter is these, these corporations won't be losing money. They won't be losing any money by paying just 1%. I think, what what did you say, negative 18% or something like that in three years? Imagine if they just paid 1% one year. We would have, our infrastructure would be restored. Welfare would be, you know, completely funded. All of these public programs would have the money necessary to survive. We wouldn't be basically you know, crabs in a barrel when it comes to our needs as a country um, from a fiscal perspective, mm -hmm. just because of 1% of one corporation's tax bill. So if you can imagine 
if every corporation, you know, who makes, you know, above a threshold amount actually paid the taxes that match the amount that we pay, we would, it, this country would be leaps and bounds ahead of our competitors. And the fact that we are so complacent, um, well, not us, but corporations and Republicans are so complacent in how things are just because it benefits them specifically. Um, I believe one of my uh, panelists said, it, it is disgusting. It is really disgusting. It definitely needs to change. All right, so I want to play this video uh, for y'all because I think it's, uh, uh, again, so people understand uh, really how uh, this tax thing works because uh, that's the next battle we're about to go into. Uh, and if you're one of the folks who literally are fighting for the riches of the world, I mean, do, do y'all realize how much money the billionaires made during COVID? An obscene amount of money. The stock market ain't for you, boo. It's not. It's for them. L listen to Robert Rice. Listen to this. Income and wealth are now more concentrated at the top than at any time over the last 80 years. And our unjust tax system is a big reason why. The tax code is rigged for the rich, enabling a handful of wealthy individuals to exert undue influence over our economy and democracy. Conservatives fret about budget deficits. Well then, to pay for what the nation needs, ending poverty, universal health care, infrastructure, reversing climate change, investing in communities, so much more. The super wealthy have to pay their fair share. First, repeal the Trump tax cuts. It's no secret Trump's giant tax cut was a giant giveaway to the rich. 65% of its benefits go to the richest fifth, 83% to the richest 1% over a decade. In 2018, for the first time on record, the 400 richest Americans paid a lower effective tax rate than the bottom half. Repealing the Trump tax cuts benefits to the wealthy and big corporations will raise an estimated $500 billion over a decade. Second, raise the tax rate on those at the top. In the 1950s, the highest tax rate on the richest Americans was over 90%. Even after tax deductions and credits, they still paid over 40%. But since then, tax rates have dropped dramatically. Today, after Trump's tax cuts, the richest Americans pay less than 26%, including deductions and credits. And this rate applies only to dollars earned in excess of $523,601. Raising the marginal tax rate by just 1% on the richest Americans would bring in an estimated $123 billion over 10 years. Third, a wealth tax on the super wealthy. Wealth is even more unequal than income. The richest one-tenth of 1% 1 of Americans have almost as much wealth as the bottom 90% put together. Just during the pandemic, America's billionaires added $1.3 trillion to their collective wealth. Elizabeth Warren's proposed wealth tax would charge 2% on wealth over $50 million and 3% on wealth over $1 billion. It would only apply to about 75,000 U.S. households, fewer than one-tenth of one percent of taxpayers. Under it, for example, Jeff Bezos would owe $5.7 billion out of his $185 billion fortune. That's less than half what he made in one day last year. The wealth tax would raise $2.75 trillion over a decade, enough to pay for universal childcare and free public college with plenty left over. Fourth, a transactions tax on trades of stock. The richest 1% owns 50% of the stock market. A tiny one-tenth of 1% 1 tax on financial transactions, just $1 per $1,000 traded, would raise $777 billion over a decade. That's enough to provide housing vouchers to all homeless people in America more than 12 times over. Fifth, end the stepped-up cost basis loophole. The heirs of the super-rich pay zero capital gains taxes on huge increases in the value of what they inherit because of a loophole called the stepped-up basis. At the time of death, 
the value of assets is stepped up to their current market value. So a stock that was originally valued at, say, $1 when purchased, but that's worth $1,000 when heirs receive it, escapes $999 of capital gains taxes. This loophole enables huge and growing concentrations of wealth to be passed from generation to generation without ever being taxed. Eliminating this loophole would raise $105 billion over a decade. Six, close other loopholes for the super rich. For example, one way the managers of real estate, venture capital, private equity, and hedge funds reduce their taxes is the carried interest loophole, which allows them to treat their income as capital gains rather than ordinary wage income. That means they get taxed at the lower capital gains rate rather than the higher tax rate on incomes. Closing this loophole is estimated to raise $14 billion over a decade. Seven, increase IRS funding. Because the IRS has been so underfunded, millionaires are far less likely to be audited than they used to be. As a result, the IRS fails to collect a huge amount of taxes from the wealthy. Collecting all unpaid federal income taxes from the richest 1% would generate at least $1.75 trillion over the decade. So fully fund the IRS. Together, these seven ways of taxing the rich would generate more than $6 trillion over 10 years, enough to tackle the great needs of the nation. As inequality has exploded, our unjust tax system has allowed the richest Americans to cheat their way out of paying their fair share. It's not radical to rein in this irresponsibility. It's radical to let it continue. Uh, kind of real basic to me there, D, to understand. And so here we are having conversations in, in the election season. Oh, America can't afford that. We can't afford that. We can't afford that. That's why. No, that's exactly why. Um, but people know that. People know this. Um, specifically, Congress knows it. Corporations know it. And for those who do not um, want to change that, it is it is reprehensible and just um, deplorable for them to gaslight the American people into thinking that it's our fault that we can't afford certain it is, it is deplorable to basically blame the poor on being poor, but not the rich for being rich. Um, they, it, it, it is just very ass backward to me, the, this system. Um, and it's obvious. Again, the trickle down effect doesn't work. Corporations just giving people money in lieu of paying into the tax system never work. Um, things need to change. Um, and again, them paying their fair share in taxes will not break the bank for them in the least. Um, the the stats that uh, the video showed, if Bezos just paid taxes at, to the equivalent of what he makes in a day, our, our entire economy would be changed for the better. And that's just one corporation. One person's taxes from one corporation. Well, in fact, uh, in fact, uh, in fact, let me show this here. Go to my laptop, please. Uh, Bezos did say this here that he supports a hike on the corporate tax rate. Uh, now, did not say if he supports the plan put forth by Joe Biden, but that he does support an increase hike in the corporate tax rate. Maybe he's saying it because he knows that uh, you have enough Democrats who are not going to vote for it. Uh, so therefore, that that will stop it right in his tracks. No, I mean, again, it. Him, again, he's saying that he wants more taxes does not necessarily mean how much. Um, like, if he's just talking about a dollar more, obviously that's not going to work. We need significant change, not just uh, talking about Bezos and his, you know, willingness to pay taxes, but the top three families that uh, you spoke about earlier. They need to pay their fair share. Walmart needs to pay their fair share. Amazon, even Target, like people places that we shop regularly, places that um, contribute to our everyday lives on a regular basis. 
um, in ways that we see and we don't see. Well, and that's the thing. That's the thing that there, Mustafa. Bottom line is, is here. Uh, look. When you look at who's making the money, we look at this wealth disparity going on, and we're talking about how do we pay for things in this country, you go to the people who are making the most damn money. And trust me, to, look, ain't that many black people. I mean, we talking about maybe it's four or five black folks. Uh, and you heard what he said, 75,000 75, families. Mm -hmm. 70, the wealth tax, Senator Elizabeth Warren's talking about, will touch only 75,000 families in the whole country. Yeah, we know who's gaming the system and we know what they look like. Um, and we also know that teachers are paying their fair share of taxes. Firefighters are paying their fair share of taxes. Bus drivers are paying their fair share of taxes. And all the other brothers and sisters who are out there on the front lines during this COVID pandemic, you know, who even though they're out there putting their lives on the line are paying their fair share of taxes. So it's time for that 1% of individuals to pay their fair share of taxes. Folks, got to go to a break. We come back. We will talk about the life and legacy of Congressman Alcee Hastings, who passed away today at the age of 84 from pancreatic cancer. We'll be joined by Congresswoman Val Demings and former Congressman Kendrick Meek next on Roller Martin Unfiltered. Cancel culture. The cancel culture. There is a vast and thriving right-wing cancel culture. She said something the cancel culture doesn't like. This is the yeah. number one issue for the country to address today. Cancel culture has become a Republican talking point, which pretty much guarantees it's been taken out of context to perpetuate their constant victimhood complex. But the idea that the public is turning its back on Republicans because of cancel culture is ridiculous. No. It's time we stop using that term. Accountability culture is accurate. Consequence culture is accurate. If any occupation in America should be subjected to the whims of the public, it's our elected officials. If Donald Trump or anyone, for that matter, gets voted out of office, it's not cancel culture. It's democracy working as intended. And listen, the consequences can be far greater if we don't hold politicians accountable for their actions. Allowing people in power to chip away at our democracy, support white supremacy, or harass teenagers in the street completely unchecked? Well, that will most definitely alter your life. And while cancel culture is not the number one issue of our time, accountability culture for elected officials should certainly be up there on that list. And boy, do I understand why these mostly white conservative men are scared shitless. They've enjoyed an era of zero accountability with zero consequences. Sorry, we've all decided that era is effectively canceled. Yo, what's up? This your boy Ice Cube. What's up? I'm Lance Gross, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. For nearly three decades, uh, he was Florida's uh, longest serving member in Congress. Congressman Alcee Hastings died today from pancreatic cancer at the age of 84. He announced he had the disease in 2019. Hastings held several key committee assignments and leadership positions throughout his career, most recently as vice chairman of the Rules Committee. Appointed by President Jimmy Carter in 1979, Hastings became Florida's first black federal judge in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District. He was impeached in 1988, but that did not hinder his congressional run in 1993. Hastings' death will impact the House. Democrats hold a narrow 218 to 211 advantage in the House, giving the party a small margin for error in passing various bills. 
Six seats are also vacant. Joining me now to talk about the life and legacy of Congresswoman Alcee Hastings and his impact in Congress, one of his colleagues, Congresswoman Val Demings, uh, and former Congressman from Florida, Kendrick Meek. Uh, glad to have uh, both of you uh, on the show. For, first and foremost, uh, Congresswoman De De Demings, uh, you're there uh, in Congress. Uh, what was it like to actually uh, serve uh, with uh, Congressman Alcee Hastings? He was uh, quite the character. Well, let me just say this. Uh, my heart, of course, goes out to his family, his friends, everyone who loved him and everyone who worked with him. You talk about somebody who wasn't ashamed or afraid to fight the good fight. And that's the fight he fought up until his death. Matter of fact, when he was diagnosed uh, with this disease, he said he's going to fight it. It's a battle worth uh, fighting for. This is a man who dedicated his life to public service. He fought for voting rights, uh, civil rights, human rights, women's rights, fought for the LGBTQ community and was unapologetic. Roland, there are some things I could, some conversations I can talk about with uh, Congressman Hastings. There are some conversations I will never talk about uh, with Congressman Hastings, but the, there is a void within the House of Representatives and uh, people might be able to fill the space, but they will never be able to take Alcee's place. Uh, Congressman Kendrick Meek, uh, as I, when I say he was uh, quite the character, uh, this video clip right here uh, gives people a little indication of how feisty uh, and how direct Hastings was. Said the governor's work with the administration, we might not be in this position. And I don't know about in your state, which I think is a crazy state to begin with, and I mean Chairman, that just I, I, as I said it. Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, some of the policies. Mr. Burgess doesn't have the time, Madam Chair. But I have the time. Mr. Hastings interrupted Mr. Burgess. Excuse me, Madam Chair. I didn't interrupt him. I reclaimed my time, and I think that that is the procedure here in this body. But, Madam the Chairman, chair the gentleman asked... made a very defamatory statement about my state, and I will not stand here and listen to it. Well, fine. Then you don't have to listen. You can leave if you choose. I told you what I think about Texas. I wouldn't live there for all the tea in China, and that's how I feel. Now, um, uh, for all intents and purposes, I know what my state did, which is, in many respects, um, uh, coming close to being just as crazy. We don't have a parliamentarian here to um, give us notes on what to say <clears throat> when people may not be saying exactly the right things. But we owe to our colleagues, especially our colleagues on this committee, a great deal of civility. There is no reason at all to impugn the people, the governor of a state of this country. And I will await the gentleman's apology and I yield back. You will wait until hell freezes over. The gentleman. Uh, for me to say anything in an apology. I would apologize to you if I was directing my comments to you. I was commenting about the state that you Chair, happened to be a resident. The I believe the gentleman. So I will not controls. apologize. <laughs> Congressman Meek. <laughs> As vintage L.C. Hastings, and he didn't mind leading at all. Um, you know, I always say that leadership is lonely. And Hastings has, uh, in this state, um, what he did in the very early 60s and 70s, um, growing up in rural Florida and then becoming, you know, a barrister and, and going to three HBCUs, a Howard, FAMU, um, um, and, and Fisk University, um, being someone that represented those who, 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 who needed the representation, even when he wasn't an elected member of Congress. Um, he was outspoken. As you know, he, he made history along with Corinne Brown and, and my mother Carrie Meek and then and, and, and being the first three to go back to Congress since Reconstruction. So his death hits with a, a heavy, heavy mallet. But I can tell you this, I spoke with his wife this morning and, um, you know, he fought a good battle. And those of us, I know the Congresswoman and others, um, will not let his memory fade as it relates to his tenacity and his forward lean. In 2000, he stood 
uh, with the uh, disenfranchised uh, voters here in Florida when the votes were stolen and walked off the floor during the electoral college vote. Um, you know, so he, he's, he's, he's a great man and, and he, he fought a good fight. And, and, and I'm so happy to have had the opportunity to serve with him and call him a friend. Uh, President Joe Biden released a statement with regards to the passing of Congressman Alcee Hastings. Folks, if we could pull that up, please. Uh, he said, I had the privilege of getting to know Alcee Hastings during the years when he served in the House of Representatives and I served in the United States Senate and later as vice president. I greatly admired him for his singular sense of humor and for always speaking the truth bluntly and without reservation. A trailblazing lawyer who grew up in the Jim Crow South, Alcee was outspoken because he was passionate about helping our nation live up to its full promise for all Americans. It was a passion he forged as a pioneering civil rights lawyer in the 1960s, uh, fighting tirelessly, tirelessly to desegregate hotels, restaurants, and public spaces in South Florida. A trailblazing spirit, um, uh, a trailblazing spirit to advocate for what is right that guided him throughout his life. Across his long career of public service, Alcee always stood up to fight for equality and always showed up for the working people he represented. And even in his final battle with cancer, he simply never gave up. Jill and I are sad to learn of his passing. May God bless Alcee Hastings and his family. President Bill Clinton, I'm going to read this, um, this uh, email here, President Bill Clinton. Uh, Hillary and I mourn the passing of our friend Alcee Hastings from his days as a young civil rights lawyer, desegregating schools in Broward County to his nearly 30 years in Congress and his long service on the Helsinki Commission. Alcee was a champion of justice, equality, and human dignity in South Florida, across America, and around the world. He was a skilled and savvy legislator who knew how to get things done for his constituents, whether he was in the majority or in a minority party, creating new economic opportunities, increasing access to quality, affordable health care, strengthening the social safety net, and protecting the environment. His fine mind, deep knowledge, and strong leadership will be missed, but his legacy will live on in all the people whose lives are better because of his service. We will, forever, we will, we will be forever grateful for his friendship and our thoughts and prayers are with Patricia, his children, everyone who loved him. Congresswoman Val Demings, uh, what's interesting is that uh, you spoke of, uh, speaking of President Biden, uh, it was Biden who picked Hastings to be a part of his team that chose federal judges, those first 11 federal judges that were announced. You know, yeah, look, Elsie Hastings was Florida, and he was a trailblazer. He was the first black federal judge uh, in Florida. And, you know, it was interesting, Roland, watching the clip in that hearing where they were talking about civility. Well, you know what? Elsie Hastings thought it wasn't very civil when you voted against children having the nutrition they need or a good education or how people, families having fair housing or being able to keep a roof over their heads. That's what he stood up for. I mean, until the day he died just weeks ago, he was still fighting for the, for the people act because people mattered. And, you know, he was the Dean of our caucus in Florida. He was the vice chair of the Florida delegation uh, when Alcee Hastings was in the room, people knew it and people listened. And I learned so much from him in the short period of time that I have uh, served in the U.S. House of Representatives. We will never forget the life and legacy of Representative Alcee Hastings. Congressman Meek, but he, he also had no problem uh, speaking his mind when it came to black folks. Uh, every year, the CBC Foundation had their annual legislative caucus. Hastings will go home. He said, it was a waste of my damn time being here. <laughs> he, didn't care, he didn't care for the Phoenix Awards. He didn't care about uh, any panels and receptions. Literally every year, I think, I think it was one year I ran to him at a CBC of dinner. But normally he said, hell, I'm going home. You know, you know Roland, I, I just want to thank you um, for recognizing his life and his memory today on your show. And, you know, you and I, we, we can go all the way back to the old convention center and, and you know, back in, in, in Washington with the CBCF. And when I became chair, I, I begged, I said, Judge, please just come to one. I'm, I'm your neighbor congressman. You got to come. He said, with well, doggone it, I'll come. I'm not standing for the whole doggone day. Well, I'll just put it this way. I'm not standing for the blank whole dinner. <laughs> so uh, he, he would he would give his ta his table to his constituents and just move on because he said this is a weekend I can spend home, and he was a very serious person. And at those times we had um, a Haitian refugee crisis taking place. He was a strong voice with the Justice Department. He was a strong voice working with Janet Reno and and, and those back in the day of fighting for Haitian rights. I mean he. 
he internationally, I mean, with him, with the Helsinki uh, Committee and Helsinki Committee and, and others uh, working throughout Africa on foreign affairs. And he served uh, Roland on one of the hardest committees to serve on, which is the Rules Committee, which was quite demanding. You know, you're there, they're there late at night and early in the morning um, making argument on behalf of Democrats and um, the House rules and, and setting the agenda. So he didn't have any slough committees. He worked his entire time there. Um, he lived in the same building. My mother and him, they, they both moved into the Hill House, and he was there for many, many years until recent. But I'm so happy that he did it his way. He won re-election, even though some in the community ran against him in his time of being sick. Um, he left this earth and moved on to a greater place. And the, the joy that I have this morning, yes, there were tears, but the joy that I had is that he went down fighting as he has always done. And when you have Elsie Hastings on your side, that's all you need. And he ran in 1970 for the United States Senate against Lawton Childs and ran a notable campaign and knew how to campaign in all 67 counties and then coached and, menaced, and, and, and mentored not only me when I ran in 2010, but others before me, including our close um, um, governor's race that we almost won this last cycle. Um, um, Elsie Hastings was in the middle of it and was the it was one of the first supporters of Andrew Gillum. Congressman Val Demings, uh, lastly, we've we've lost um, um, a number of uh, longtime CBC members. Uh, last year, losing Congressman John Lewis. Uh, this year, Congressman Elsie Hastings. Both of them passing away due to pancreatic cancer. And for as someone who is a, a relatively new member. Uh, of the House. Uh, how important is it uh, for the public to understand uh, the role that uh, these senior leaders have played in? Because I think a lot of people, they go, well, how many names is your bill on? How many bills did you get passed? Without really understanding uh, that you can serve 20, 30, 40 years in Congress, wield a significant amount of power, and not have your name on many bills. That's absolutely correct. And, you know, the majority of people who serve uh, in Congress do not have their names on a lot of bills, but that does not mean they're not doing a lot of work. And the people that you named, uh, you know, Elsie Hastings, uh, John Lewis, uh, Elijah Cummings, John Conyers, these were trailblazers who really worked hard for civil rights, equal rights, during a time when the laws were not on their side, but they kept up the good fight. And so while they're gone and we miss them dearly, uh, it's gonna, gonna be tough to, to get to a place where we, you know, we feel better about what has happened today. They have left us a roadmap. Uh, it is our time, it is our turn. And what we have to do is remember the struggles that they went through through really difficult times. And we have to pick up the mantle and carry their legacy. And doing that, as my friend and colleague Alcee Hastings say, said, is a battle worth fighting. Congressman, Congresswoman Val Demings, uh, former Congressman Kendrick Meek, we certainly appreciate uh, you sharing your thoughts regarding uh, Congressman Alcee Hastings. Uh, like I said, we always had a good time talking, sharing with one another. So uh, there was no way in the world I wouldn't uh, pay respects uh, to him and his life and legacy uh, on Roland Martin Unfiltered. And certainly thoughts and prayers go out to his family. Thank you. Mustafa, I want to go to you. Uh, you actually posted a comment today about uh, Alcee Hastings. Uh, go ahead and share your thoughts. Yeah, Congressman Hastings was the truth. I mean, he was sharp. I want people to remember he was extremely sharp. He was fearless. Uh, and, and he was one of the giants, one of the greats, just like uh, Representative Demings just shared with folks. You know, I was blessed to be mentored uh, by folks like him and John Lewis. And of course, I worked for John Conyers and, and Elijah Cummings. And I remember the first time I met him in 2007. I was uh, sitting in his office, uh, probably wasn't supposed to be there, but a good friend of mine by the name of Alex Johnson was working for him. And I remember he came in and he was greeting folks who were there. And he looked at me and he was like, uh, who are you? <laughs> and I said, I'm Mustafa Ali. And he said, well, who do you work for? I said, John Conyers. And he said, well, what issues do you focus on? I said, environmental justice. And he said, me too. And that began our journey together because in 2007, he introduced, at a time, 
Now, you see everybody talking about environmental justice now. This was a time when there were very few folks on Capitol Hill who were putting any attention on environmental justice at that time. And he introduced the Environmental Justice Access and Implementation Act at that time, spent all kinds of time talking to folks. And he used to always say, make them, you know, make them put their money where their mouth is. So he was saying that these federal agencies and departments needed to actually have offices of environmental justice inside of them and not just you know, going along with what the executive order was, but actually putting some teeth into it at that time. And he also said that the folks who were on the ground, because he had Superfund sites and Brownfield sites in his community, some very toxic sites that he had been working on, he said folks deserve to know and have information that they can see, um, and that is um, clear. Um, and that was a part of that bill and a number of other things. And now you fast forward, and it's so important for people to understand, as was said earlier, that so many of these great leaders did the work before it became vogue, before people, you know, started to embrace the issues. And he was one of those individuals. So now when you see President Biden, you know, doing all these incredible things around environmental justice and climate issues, you got to go back and give credit to folks like Congressman Hastings and folks like Congressman Lewis, who both of them introduced some of the landmark pieces of legislation that didn't get passed, but began to build that framework. So I will always be grateful to him. And as I've always said, his legacy will live on, not just on Capitol Hill, but in all the work that is happening on the front lines across our country. Um, Kelly, D, uh, thoughts and reflections on Alcee Hastings. Kelly first. Well, for me, um, this is a great loss, not just for Florida, but the entire country. It is clear, such as uh, Representative Demings uh, described, our greats are leaving this world, you know, and we have a unique situation in which we unfortunately still need people to carry the mantle that these greats created and carried themselves. And the question becomes, who is going to carry these mantles? Who is going to take up the charge and and fill these footsteps? Because it's not a we're we're not in a situation where things are necessarily better. It is just more uh spread out so to speak, the problems. Um, they're more nuanced now. Um, and for some problems, they are just outright being um, reintroduced to society, such as the Voting Rights Act. Our women's rights are, are under attack still. Everything is back into the fold in, in this, in this uh, predicament of fighting for our rights again. So who's going to take up these mantles? Who is going to fill the shoes of these greats, such as uh, now Hastings, um, such as Cummings. I was an intern for Elijah Cummings when I was in law school, and just the lessons that I learned by osmosis from him will carry me throughout my life. For those of us who were under the tutelage of these greats, we have a, a cross to bear, so to speak. I know we're just on the tail end of of Easter, but we are now in Pentecost season, so it still applies. But we, we have a cross to bear. We have shoes to fill, and we have our marching orders from these people still. And for those who are in Congress, who are in a position to fill these shoes more immediately, please do so now. Please take up the mantle now and introduce those laws. M uh, mobilize, monetize, make sure that their legacies don't die with them and make sure that they are carried on through them, through us, through you. D. And I can just echo what they both said. I am so appreciative of uh, the congressman because he said what he meant and meant what he said. You didn't have to figure out which side he was on. And that's what I appreciate about him and other leaders who have gone on. They were very clear. Their yay was yay, their nay was nay. And we knew how to proceed. And they weren't afraid to speak up um, for what was just and right. And it didn't matter if they offended people. They just continued on with the mission at hand. Well, speaking of folks uh, who are uh, unclear when they talk, Mitch McConnell. Y'all, today this fool actually was asked about corporations uh, speaking out about the voter suppression uh, bills passed through Georgia. And <laughs> listen to what this fool said. My warning, if you will, to corporate America is to stay out of politics. It's not what you're designed for. And don't be intimidated by the left into taking up 
causes that put you right in the middle of one of America's greatest political debates. So that's, that's my admonition. And Delta and uh, the other Coca-Cola and the other companies that basically responded to this partisan appeal are doing the same thing. You know, Republicans drink Coca-Cola too. And we fly. And we like baseball. Uh, this is a pretty competitive political environment in America, as I just pointed out, a 50-50 Senate. If I were running a major corporation, I'd stay out of politics. I'm, I'm not talking about political contributions. Most of them contribute to both sides. They have political action committees. That's fine. It's legal. It's appropriate. I support that. I'm talking about taking a position on a highly incendiary issue like this and punishing a community or a state because you don't like a particular law they passed, I just think it's stupid. So, D, he's saying, I'll take your money, but shut up. I said it yesterday. Mitch McConnell sound like a pimp. He'll take the money from his women, but y'all shut up. That's what it sound like. I mean, he's literally saying, oh, no, 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 no. And, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't Republicans assert during Citizen United that corporations are people too? They most certainly do. So now, again, we take y'all money, your dark money included, but shut the hell up when you disagree with us. Exactly. And so the roosters are, you know, uh, chickens are coming home to roost. And it's so funny. Stay out of it. Stay out of what? I mean, this is the reason why you want to give them tax breaks. But when they speak up, you get upset. And then to say you punish who was punished? You mean the Republicans who uh, passed unjust, unethical, and ridiculous voting laws in Georgia? Is that, is that who's being punished? Well, you know what? It, it is what it is. And I just hope that the corporations have the courage and the testicular will to continue doing what they're doing so that it doesn't trickle down to other states. So McConnell needs to go have several seats. That's what he needs to do. The, the, the thing here that I find just absolutely hilarious, Mustafa, is uh, y'all get out of politics. Don't 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 be weighing in. Uh, I'm sorry, but if I give money, I got the right to open my damn mouth. And if y'all do something that that's gonna have harm to my company because of how constituents respond, I'm probably gonna say something. Yeah, I'm so glad you said the pimp thing because I was going to say it's very pimpish, so I didn't have <laughs> to say that. So I'm glad, so I don't get in trouble today. But you know, it, it's really interesting. I mean, he treats folks like 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 side pieces, <laughs> if I can say it that way. You know, where you know, be seen, uh, but don't be heard, and and and, and don't uh, get in the way type of thing. And it was interesting. When, uh, you know, he started talking about, you know, we drink Coca-Cola and we fly and we like baseball. I was wondering, well, do you like democracy? And, and do you like voting rights? Because everything you've been doing and supporting has been going in that opposite direction. So all I can say is, Kentucky, you get what you get when you vote the way you vote. One of the brokest damn states in the country, uh, Kelly, keeps electing somebody who don't give a damn about how broke they are. I mean, just to piggyback off of Mustafa for a second, I would venture to say that a side piece has more rights and and say over their person than <laughs> than what Mitch McConnell ventures to think a corporation has. Um, like we have all just said, uh, not too long ago, we were just told that corporations are people too. So as far as I'm concerned, we need to let the people speak. And that is exactly what's happening here. Um, Voting rights affect corporations as well in that, you know, people work in those corporations. Uh, and if those people in those corporations decide not to live in Georgia anymore, what good is the corporation going to be 
if they have no employees in Georgia? What good is the corporation going to be if another voting law such as the one in Georgia comes down in Kentucky, in Tennessee, in Florida, and those people strike or what have you? Um, that was the 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 uh, undercurrent uh, theory behind Citizens United. You know, you have people in the corporations, and therefore corporations are people. Clearly, that's not the case. But if Mitch Khan wants to use that logic, then that's what we're going to use now. Um, it <laughs> again, the Republicans are hypocritical as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. If it does not work in their favor, they will do Bikram yoga to stretch and bend over backwards to make something work for them. And if that doesn't work, they just take the bar, raise it, lower it, break it, fix it, what have you, anything necessary to make sure that whatever rule they want to have applied applies to just them because that's all they want. So, I mean, again, like, like uh, uh, my colleague said, just have several seats, you know, deal with it. Uh, deal with you. The, the um, speaking of, speaking of that because it's all tied to the same thing. And actually, I'm going to bring in my next guest as a part of this uh, because I definitely want to get this comment on this. You know, so I've been talking about this whole voter suppression stuff, y'all, uh, and how silent uh, the only Republican in the United States Senate has been on this, and that is Senator Tim Scott. So he decided today of all days to post a tweet. To post a tweet. Uh, Y'all, here's a tweet uh, that I find to be quite interesting, quite interesting. He tweets, Georgia, voter ID, 17 days of early voting. Colorado, voter ID, 15 days of early voting. Atlanta is 51% black. Denver is 9.2% black. The MLB is moving the MLB All-Star Game out of Atlanta, which has more day of voting rights than Colorado. The wokes are at it again, folks. Now, now, now mind y'all, uh, I, I want you, I want you to, um, I want you to, uh, understand what they've been doing, how the Republicans, how they have been using the talking points all day, y'all, all day long, talking about, oh, Colorado, Colorado, and what's happening in Colorado, and, oh, you know, they, we, got, we got more early voting days in Georgia than Colorado. Yeah, but 90% of the people in Colorado vote by mail. In Colorado, they also mail an absentee ballot to everyone in the state. In Colorado, they have nearly 400 drop boxes. Georgia, less than half of that. But Colorado's population is half that of Georgia. So, Mark Morial, CEO of the National Urban League, we're gonna talk about Kristen Clark in a moment, but I wanna talk about this. The reason I'm laughing is because if all of a sudden, I'm talking about on Fox News, I got conservatives hitting me left and right, Talking about Colorado, Colorado, Colorado. I'm like, boo, if y'all want to compare to Colorado, let's pass the same laws they got in Colorado. Colorado don't need all the early voting days because they have a successful vote by mail and have one of the highest voting participation uh, rates in America. Mark, these, these conservatives and Republicans are laughable with the comparison to Georgia and Colorado because they mad they love baseball game got pulled. You know, Roland, they're, they're, they're reaching, they're stretching, they're reaching. This entire voter suppression uh, effort uh, is uh, sour grapes. It's all a reaction because when people turn out in large numbers, when people turn out uh, to vote in a passionate way as they did in 2020, uh, right wing uh, conservatism does not win. And this is what is so crucial is that uh, I'm, I'm a little disappointed in Tim Scott. You know, come on, man. You're going to take, if you will, uh, these things out of complete context and talk about early voting. And, you know, Roland, you made the point, as you always do. Look at the totality of the voting system in Colorado. It is designed for access. It is a mail ballot goes to every home. Every person has the right to vote by mail. Now, shouldn't that be the rule? Shouldn't that be the system in every single state? But no, now you've got this pandemic of voter suppression sweeping the country because some believe the only way they can win an election is by changing the rules, by altering the rules. 
it would be as though you lose a basketball game and you say, you know what, let's, and, and the other team was dunking on me, let's raise the basket to 12 feet high. Uh, let's get rid of the shot clock so we can stall the ball and they can't run anymore. They want to change the rules. And they want to change the rules in a way that harkens back to the Jim Crow era, not the Jim Crow era of the 60s, but the Jim Crow era of the late 1800s. And, and here's so what I find to be, history. here's what I find to be just beyond laughable, uh, Mark, here. So this, again, how the talking point goes out real quick. Uh, this is somebody else black, Harrison Faulkner, on Fox News. I mean, again, listen to how ridiculous they are by trying to compare to Colorado. But, Joe, from what, what you're saying, Atlanta, all of Georgia can be hurt by these decisions. And I want to point out, who did their homework on Denver? Who did their homework on Colorado? Compare the voter laws. Is their ID required in Colorado, like Georgia? Yes, to vote in person. Sometimes you have to bring a picture ID if it's your first time. And in Colorado, 15 days of early voting, that's less than the early days of voting, that the fewer than they have in Georgia, 17 to 19 there. Yeah, Harris, I, I don't think many of these companies really, truly studied the bill or saw the fact checks that were done on them. And I think, honestly, they're just responding to this woke mob on Twitter that kind of really doesn't exist. They sound loud and they scream about boycotts. But in the end, if you stand your ground in these situations and say, look, uh, we're not going to get involved here politically. In Atlanta, for instance, with Major League Baseball, we're going to honor the great Hank Aaron. Sometimes we can't tell the future. But Joe, from what, love, what you're I, I saying, I love the whole, the whole Atlanta? again, the, the pimping of Hank, of Henry Aaron. First of all, he didn't like being called Hank, Henry Aaron. But Mark, the reason that offends me is because again, they are used to talking to dumb people on Fox News, people who believe whatever they say, and so it's like, oh, Colorado is so much more restrictive. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Uh, in, in, in the words of uh, Paul Harvey, now the rest of the story. Um, Go ahead. Hey, look, Roland, uh, I'm glad you're focusing on this uh, because what we see on Fox News is what we always see on Fox News, distortions, half-truths, uh, feigned uh, outrage, uh, parading as truth. It's not even worth watching because of what the the distortions and the twistings of the truth. Uh, right now, Roland, what we've got to do and what I'm focused on, uh, in addition to pushing back against voter suppression in Georgia, we've got to get Benita Gupta That's right. and Christian Clark confirmed uh, at the Justice Department. And it is absolutely offensive that these two highly qualified women of color, one an Indian American, the other an African American, uh, have been smeared by right-wingers. Uh, these women, one went to Harvard, the other went to Yale. They have impeccable records as lawyers, as civil rights lawyers, uh, as, as, as mothers. Uh, these women do not deserve this smear campaign, and we're going to stand up to it, uh, Roland. They deserve to be confirmed. Why is there a smear campaign? Because... Clearly, uh, I think some understand that they will be serious in restoring the integrity uh, to the Department of Justice, removing the politics from civil rights enforcement, uh, and improving, or rather restoring, the reputation of the Justice Department as not only a law enforcement agency, but as an agency that's true to his name, and that is to promote justice. I've worked with both of them uh, for years. In the case of Kristen Clark, since she was a very young lawyer working in the Civil Rights Division at the Justice Department on Louisiana's uh, legislative reapportionment plan uh, in the early 2000s, to her time as a, uh, a lawyer working at the Legal Defense Fund, later the state of New York, uh, now later at the Lawyers Committee, now the nominee to be the chief civil rights enforcer uh, in the United States. Uh, Vanita Gupta worked for President Obama as the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, uh, went on to become 
head of the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights. Uh, she's a measured, a smart, uh, fair-minded uh, lawyer uh, who now has the support of many law enforcement groups as well as civil rights groups. So we're going to stand up. Why have they been singled out for a smear campaign? Hundreds of thousands of dollars spent on television advertising to try to smear their reputation in an effort to derail their confirmation. We're not going to let it happen, Roland. It is, it is, it is, it's truly laughable to watch what these folks are doing because they somehow think they were stupid. The reality is, these Republicans, they are scared to death of Vanita Gupta. They're scared to death of Christian Clark. Why? Because they're excellent at what they do. They know, they know what they are doing. They do not want a strong Department of Justice that stands up for civil rights. They want the continuation of pure craziness we've seen in the last four years. Uh, and that's why Vanita is further along. Uh, she's already gotten marked up. Uh, Christian is going to have her hearing uh, next okay. Wednesday. Uh, and you're going to see vicious attacks on Christian Clark uh, next week, Mark. Final comment. And, and look, I'm confident she'll be ready, uh, that she'll be prepared. Uh, that she'll be prepared to uh, answer forthrightly and stand up uh, to any unfair questioning. I saw some of the questioning uh, in Vanita Gupta's case. And, you know, Roland, something is wrong when members of the United States Senate uh, engage in hazing behavior. So I'd like us all to serve as watchdogs uh, when, when Kristen's hearing takes place and call out those who act in an unfair, abusive, disrespectful fashion in a congressional hearing. Look, you can have sharp disagreements. You can have differences of opinion. Uh, but the idea that you're going to haze, that you're going to turn the entire thing into some sort of uh, almost a, a, a high school, uh, if you will, exercise, really is offensive to me. And it's beneath the dignity of the United States Senate and the offices to which these two women have been nominated. Uh, and I encourage people uh, the, uh, to understand the seriousness of the moment where two civil rights leaders have been nominated to serve in the Justice Department. This is an important step, and we want to make sure they're confirmed. And they should be confirmed. Well, and, and in Kristen's case, if she is confirmed, she will be the first woman ever confirmed by the United States Senate to head the Civil Rights Division. Uh, Vanita previously headed it, but she was the interim, but there's never been That's a woman correct. confirmed by the United States Senate for this job. You're correct, Roland. And uh, and uh, she she's so deserving of confirmation. Uh, she's a close friend and a professional colleague. Uh, we work very closely together. Let me say this. Uh, Vanita and Christian are measured. They're fair-minded. They have integrity. They pay their dues. Uh, and community, we're going to stand up for them. Mark Morial, CEO of National Urban League. We appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Hey, well, and always, thank you. D, you're there in Georgia. I I'm really laughing at these Republicans uh, who are tripping and trying to bring up Colorado. And I'm sitting there going, hey, if y'all want to, if y'all want to mirror the voting laws in Colorado, baby, we're more than happy to do it. You know what? They are so ridiculous. Um, and they're being, beginning to believe the lies that they tell. Um, a few years ago, when I was actually in the General Assembly, I actually uh, sponsored legislation that was similar to Colorado's for us to be able to mail people absentee ballots and to have almost full participation and mail-in ballots as well. And they rejected it because they want to reject anything that will to be inclusive of the masses. All they want to do is change the rules now because, as someone said earlier, they're sore losers. They're absolutely ridiculous. And this is why I'm all out for the boycott. I mean, we, if it was up to me, I wouldn't buy anything in Georgia right about now other than the necessities that I have to have. And so Mitch McConnell, he's ridiculous. Brian Kemp is ridiculous. And all of the people who fool with him are ridiculous. And so they've lied so much. They're nothing but lying liars who tell lies every day to uh, outrage and get their base all worked up. This is crazy. You should see how they're acting. They're about to lose their mind because MLB pulled out of Georgia. 
Right. I mean, yeah. and, and the, the, the reason the reason I'm, I'm I'm laughing because Kelly, what you're seeing is you're seeing how the re- right wing Republican talking points get sent out. So like today, all of them, Colorado, 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 Colorado. And you're also about Colorado because and, and they're latching on. Colorado requires a voter ID, uh, and, and they got 15 days. Uh, Georgia got 17 days. But y'all want to ignore everything else in the bill except those two things. Now, now, sorry, we know how to read. See, there's a reason they ain't want black folks to learn how to read uh, during slavery. See, now we know how to read. Well, not only do we know how to read, it is also, again, the hypocrisy of the Republican Party is just so great because the reason that Republicans even gained this much uh, traction in the House and were able to preserve their standing in the Senate is because of the voting laws that were in place before this, really, repeal of voting laws in Georgia. So the only person who really lost in in the 2020 election of importance was Donald Trump. Everybody, as a rule, you know, in summary of the election of 2020, Republicans actually did a fantastic job in terms of preserving seats, gaining seats, and the like. And it was due in part to the voting laws that were already on the books and also expanding some of them that were already on the books because of COVID, being mail-in and uh, absentee voting and the expansion of such policies. So for them to shrink it, expecting the same results or better than 2020 is... Is, is asinine because it, that doesn't make any sense. So what they're asking, what they're comparing in terms of Colorado, frankly, they look he had it. Um, they just needed to expand it a little bit if that's what they really wanted to do. So again, the the like you said, the talking points don't make any sense. Republicans don't make any sense at this point. Um, but what is clear is that they are scared. They are scared of losing. They are scared of the the browning of this country. They are scared that white supremacy will no longer reign supreme. And Ted Cruz himself said, if the four people, if the four the people act voting laws actually went through in the Senate, he said, quote, the GOP won't re- win elections for generations. That is the key here. It's not just Georgia. Yeah, they're upset about Georgia, but they're upset about the the snowball effect of um of what will happen if Georgia didn't pass this law in the first place. So, again, with the hypocrisy, again, with them just simply not making sense. Um, but, again, if they want to go and and do what Colorado's doing, by all means, do it and, and let Democrats win like we're supposed to be because we're actually listening to the people at this point. Mustafa, again, I, I'm just... I, I, I want people to understand how these things work how they move and how they flow and how they start uh, trying to drum stuff up. And I'm sitting there going, hey, if y'all look at, like, like all of a sudden they're also saying, well, uh, look, at, uh, 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 look at New York. New York has this and this. Yo, we're dealing with y'all. But again, if they would like, if they would like to compare to Colorado, I am more than happy to say Georgia rep- legislators, please, by all means, copy the Colorado voting law, please. We would greatly appreciate you doing that. No, I agree with you. It's like watching a shell game with somebody who doesn't know what they're doing on the street. And they got the shells and they're going like this and they pick it up and they say, pick which one? And then you pick it and they're like, wait, 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 hold on for a second. And they keep going again. And that's the way the Republican Party has acted. You know, they, uh, there's no depth um, in what they're trying to sell to the American public. You know, they place these veneers over top of issues, and when you actually move past the veneer, you see that there's no substance that's there to justify what they're doing. The way I look at it is that voter suppression, they need voter suppression because they have uh, antiquated policies. They have policies that are out of step with the majority of what Americans are asking for. And they need voter suppression also because they have an antiquated party that refuses to grow and evolve um, and, and to begin to move into the 21st century. And because they have that, They are now, and this is the part that's super critical for everyone to pay attention to, and we've raised it before, and we need to raise it on every show, is that they also understand if they can get this voter suppression in place, 
Then they can make sure that when it comes time to do redistricting and the gerrymandering opportunities that present themselves, then they can continue to shift power and to consolidate power. And we need to be very aware of that is the game that's going on. So for all of the foolishness, for all of this craziness that people talk and these crazy sets of examples that they put out there, you've got to understand that there is a plan that's in place to remove power from the masses and to consolidate it into a much smaller set of individuals who will then actually for decades determine what America looks like. Indeed, folks. And so uh, Kristen Clark, as I said, uh, we'd, we'd tie up both of these because it's all uh, combined. She is going to have her uh, Senate confirmation hearing uh, next Wednesday, April 14th. We'll be live streaming it live right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered. And every single day this week, uh, we will be focusing uh, on a segment. Uh, on, actually, every day this week and next Monday and Tuesday, uh, people uh, explaining why it's important for us to uh, certainly uh, stand with Kristen Clark. Uh, hopefully, we can get Sherilyn Eiffel, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, on the show to discuss this. Uh, so that's what we'll do. At the launch of break, we come back. We're going to talk our black business segment, crowdfunding. How that could drive your business. That's next on Roller Martin Unfiltered. Who needs a little love today? Who needs some love sent their way? I'm Kim Burrell. Hi, I'm Carl Payne. Hey, everybody. This is Sherry Shepard. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Funding is essential to the success of any startup business. Fund Black Founders' mission is to assist with crowdfunding for black entrepreneurs. Joining us now is Renee King. She is the founder of Fund Black Founders. Renee, how are you doing? Great. How are you? Doing great. So, uh, how did so? Why did you start this? Where, where, um, where did it come from? Where you like? You know what? We got to do this thing. Uh, well, this actually started when I was my first startup. Um, which was focused on helping elderly um, using technology. And I was at a conference where a black um, investor actually shamed a group of black entrepreneurs for not being able to raise a friends and family round. Um, and that was really troubling to me because when you think about what a friends and family round is, as for, you know, let's say someone who started Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg probably got a check of like 25000 from an aunt, 50000 from an uncle to go ahead and start Facebook. That's not a black entrepreneur's experience, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you know the uh, the average liquid savings for a black family is less than $2,000, we're not getting a check from, you know, our aunt for 25,000 to start our businesses, right? So what's happening is uh, black entrepreneurs, we're scrunching together like, you know, our day job salaries, all of our personal credit and savings to get maybe around 30,000 versus white entrepreneurs are starting businesses with over $106,000. So there's a significant gap. So we jumped in and decided to start funblackfounders.com. Uh, we are a rewards crowdfunding platform that allows everyday people to help black founders grow their businesses from start to profitability. Um, and that's why we started, because we also see that it's not just about buying black, but we also have to fund black when you think about the significant gap that's going on with businesses. Uh, and, and you're absolutely right. We talk about that friends and family round. Look, it, look, it, it simply isn't there. Uh, and, and you have these great ideas, but the bottom line is uh, folks uh, you know, can't reach out. So, so when it comes to, so what exactly do y'all do? Uh, to help somebody. So let's say somebody's watching right now. They got an idea. The rules have also changed now with crowdfunding. It used to be uh, you could only do up to, a, what, 1.1 million. I think now it's raised down to 5 million that you can raise via crowdfunding. So what does Fund Black Founders do 
for the entrepreneur? So what we do for the entrepreneur is we help the entrepreneur from start to finish of putting together and building their crowd that they need to run a successful crowdfunding campaign, helping them to put together their campaign assets, their campaign marketing, coaching them through the process and helping them launch their campaign and fulfill it. So for founders like um, Chantel Calloway is one of the founders who's currently on our platform. Um, she is actually the founder of a game called Rymantics, which is the first black owned party game to make it to the shelves of two big box retailers, Walmart and Target. For her, she came to us. We helped her start to build and nurture the crowd, help her put together a campaign, help her launch it. Um, and now she's currently at around 21000 She's raising money um, this way using our platform because it's one thing for her to be on those shelves, but now she needs to like compete with the Hasbro's and these bigger companies, right? She has to compete by like building out her marketing um, budget that she needs so that she can market and tell people to go there to buy the game, um, getting her operational budget that she needs. So what happens now is that her campaign is live on our platform. And we've helped her put it together. And folks who are listening to this, um, folks who come to our platform with as little as contrib contributing around $20, $25, you can help an entrepreneur like Chantel keep her game on these shelves. So you can see more Black-owned products and businesses in these stores. So that's what we do. Um, we do a little bit more than that, too. So outside of the crowdfunding, we are also really a true friends and family feel. Um, so we support our founders with other things that they need, whether it's connections to investors, connections to accelerators, things of that sort. We really, like, coach them and support them, and we're a nice ear for them to, like, whatever they're going through outside, they can come in and feel completely comfortable. It feels like your home. This is like where you belong and you can completely take the barriers off, take the, you know, your normal mask off and just say what's going on. And we coach our founders through it. How many uh, companies have you helped? So we've actually helped, um, we've had over 3000 people who have come together to fund over 20 businesses. We started in January, 2020. So we're still in our infancy. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done. And, and when you say help, are, are they on your platform or are you help them platform. raise money on other crowdfunding platforms? So we've done both, but those 20 are on our platform. Um, and the 3,000 people who have come together to be this new like friends and family round for black entrepreneurs, they have funded them with over $334,000 for just these 20 ones who are on our platform. We've also helped entrepreneurs on other platforms too. Um, so we've not, we don't only say our platform, but majority of them are on our platform. Questions from our pound. D, you're first. Yes, I have a question. I just love this entire concept. Is yours more of just a rewards um, type of crowdfunding or do you have incentives for people who may want to get a piece of the company on the back end, kind of like um, equity? Right. So thank you for asking that question. And it's important to clarify. We are a rewards-based crowdfunding platform. We are not equity-based, right? There are other platforms that are equity. Um, and the difference is that for rewards, when you contribute to any of our campaigns, you are going to get a pre-order of a service or the entrepreneur's product, whatever it is, or maybe merch. You're going to get some type of thing like that. But on our campaigns, there is a contact button for all of our founders. So if you are interested in possibly investing in that entrepreneur, you can click that contact button and start engaging with that entrepreneur to see if you're interested in that. Um, we encourage you to follow our entrepreneurs. Most of them will end up on the pathway of like they use rewards to get started right? Because equity crowdfunding, there's a significant, um, a lot of work that you have to do to get prepared for that too. And you need to be a little bit further along in business. So we encourage you to follow along with our entrepreneurs because it'll probably be their next step. And you'll probably hear from us around that. Uh, Kelly. So I heard uh, you talk about how that you will connect some of these uh, companies with people who can help them. Is that something that is part of your business model, meaning yes, do you have like a, a, a program that will basically like, like a mentorship program or like a tutelage, um, a sec of your, of, of your website and your, and your program as a whole? Yes, it is. Um, so what happens is if you know what a true friends and family round is, it's not just getting like a check 
right, from an aunt or uncle. It's also having connections, our social capital. And we um, literally build relationships with different, like whether it's investors or accountants or lawyers. And as we, as our founders come in, and we learn about them and they apply and we start to hear more of where they are in their journey, we start to plug them in as for what resource we feel is right for them at that time. So yes, so those connections come from, this is part of our full friends and family package, I guess you can say. Mustafa. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for doing this and filling this this need and this gap. You know, I'm really big on uh, figuring out ways to educate the general public because sometimes we make some assumptions that they understand um, some of the basics. So I'm just curious, do you all do training or when folks go to your website, is there information on the basics about what crowdfunding is and hopefully ways that we can pull uh, more folks of color into that space? So that's coming. Um, We do a lot of education. I say we do a lot of webinars, um, but we are launching soon a knowledge base that will have more information around that. Um, But all of our entrepreneurs, as they come in, like, for example, every Thursday at 5.30 p.m., um, we host live educational sessions with everyone. So you're welcome to come, and it's free for everyone to get general information. The next step is you will see more of a knowledge base that will be on our site where you can read it and peruse it anytime you want. But I 100% agree with you on that. It's all about education and awareness, and we've been doing that in various um, sessions or conferences of that sort. We speak about it a lot. All right, then, folks, it's funblackfounders.com. You see it right there, funblackfounders.com. Renee King, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. All right, folks, uh, y'all know how we crowdfund. That is, we have you contribute directly to our Bring the Funk fan club. We appreciate all of you who have done so. More than 20,000 of you gave last year, and so we certainly appreciate that. Uh, there are many ways you can give. Of course, Cash App, dollar sign, RM Unfiltered, PayPal.me, forward slash R Martin Unfiltered, Venmo.com, forward slash RM Unfiltered, Zelle, Roland at RolandSMartin.com, or Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Uh, you can also... Uh, mail your money order to New Vision Media, Inc., 1625 K Street, Northwest, Suite 400, Washington, D.C., 2006. Kelly, Mustafa, and D, I certainly appreciate uh, y'all being on our panel today. Thank you so very much. Folks, that is it for us. Uh, don't forget, every single day we live stream uh, the Derek Chauvin murder trial. So y'all simply go to our YouTube channel, watch it there. If you miss any of our segments from yesterday or before, look, all you got to do is just go to our YouTube channel as well. And don't forget, if y'all give on YouTube, it's more than 4,000 of y'all in there today. You can support us directly because remember, we get 55 cents of every dollar you give on YouTube versus you sending the money right to us. And so we certainly appreciate uh, if you would do that. All right, folks, that is it. Uh, more details, go to rollermarkunfiltered.com to support what we do because we're all about keeping it real, keeping it black, keeping it unfiltered. I'll see y'all tomorrow.